This podcast is available thanks to the Access Internet Radio Project, funded by New Zealand On Air. Choice, guys. On 22nd of February, a team of police forensic photographers from around New Zealand, led by Sergeant Jerry Rivet, were working in the red zone, in the CBD red zone. And I'm talking to one of them now from Auckland, Briar Douglas. Briar, welcome to the programme. Hi, thank you very much. This is an incredible book <clears throat> that has been put out, Christchurch Beyond the Cordon, uh, through the eyes of the New Zealand police photographers. And I I don't know how, I mean, I want to know how it was for you that day. If you can go back to that day, I'm sure it must be very um, firm in your memory. Uh, how was it for a day in the life of... A day in the life of being down there, I was I was there for 12 days. Um, I arrived two days after that initial major earthquake on the 22nd. Um, I covered some late shifts and night shifts, so probably one of our late shifts involved uh, 10-hour shifts where we were transported in from Lincoln University, where we were being held, um, having a briefing with the day shift, and they were updating us on recoveries, uh, if they'd been able to uh, find any, uh, which sites were being um, still attended to. Um, we then aligned with one of the DVI teams that would be working and headed off to, I was based at CT, CTV site for about three days, um, where it's been is just a very long and slow process, especially for us as we're uh, waiting for the call from DVI as they uh, slowly sifting through the lower levels of that building. It it must be it must have been a, a grim work, and I mean your day to day work and any days to day work must be demanding. But this would be particularly so. It was a total, uh, totally different angle, I suppose. It's definitely still very grim, but my the only thing I can liken it to is our day to day work is through generally crime. Um, there'll be crashes, that sort of thing, but it's generally crime, which is, you know, a, a cause by someone or something else, whereas this is just unpredictable, couldn't plan it, nature takes over, and so it's, it's no one to blame, and that's probably the hardest thing. You were working alongside search and rescue and uh, victim identification teams and uh, documenting what was happening, um, and your work is rarely seen by the public, isn't isn't it? It's I mean, we don't often see you at work. No, very very rarely. Our um, work is basically well, obviously for a police, uh, for evidence, and for court is our end. That's as much public as it would get as it goes to the court and for jurors. Um, and especially in regards to the work we do, we actually go out of our way to avoid photographs in including police in it, uh, we want to just record evidence. So it's a complete sort of step away from our normal work by making sure we're actually, we want to show these people in there and doing what they're doing. Did you ever feel it danger, in danger? Uh, I was very aware of how unstable it was in there. Um, I didn't, I didn't feel in danger to a point, uh, we went everywhere with our hard hats. When I arrived, we were issued hard hats, uh, first aid kits that had to be belted onto our belt, and didn't, we didn't go without them. And But it was only times when I was walking down, and we made a point of walking down the centre of the street away from any buildings, but at the same time realising, if another one hits, someone said to me, where are you going to go? And looking around, realising, I can't run, I'll be falling over, and yeah, being very aware that can't plan when this is going to happen. Those must have been long days for um, 12 days. Um, how do you keep up your energy? Uh, good planning in advance. Um, when we moved out to Lincoln Uni, uh, that was an incredible setup. They're obviously set up for the university students anyway, but I just found uh, their kitchen, they were open all the time for us. People were coming and going 24 hours and there was just no question of um, you going in and being able to get good food. Um, I sussed out very early where where the shops were and yeah, just planning in advance. I was taking in my you know just food, protein, that sort of stuff into work 
and also there were catering people in there for us as well and for all the search and rescue people. Attached to um, a disaster victim identification team, your main focus was photo- photo- uh, taking photographs of the victims, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. So the that they found that could be linked down the track to someone. You know, a handbag would come out. And rather than discard it, that may be very important because generally someone's handbag is normally with them. So in the hopes that that may tie into what, who we find or what we may find, that may be another link. So as well as that, you were very aware that this was a chance, just one chance to take photographs as well of the buildings falling down or being pulled down or whatever. Um so you almost had two tasks, didn't you? Yes, I think we almost created that ourselves. And when we first got there, um, certainly um, Sergeant uh, Jerry Rivette, um was very proactive, I suppose, in the fact that it, it, we did realise quite early that this was um, a, a very rare happening, we, we certainly hope. Um, and because, I suppose, it, it was such a slow, methodical process, for us, we we had the opportunity, really, that the search and rescue guys didn't. You know, they they were in constant their entire shift. Where of course ours is, we're full on. Then we're not doing anything. So we're able to you know, make the most of what was happening and what what had happened in that in that area. Well, certainly Christchurch people um, who were in, in the earthquake and Christchurch people from afar um, who knew Christchurch well will be so thankful that we have this book because, um, I mean, it, it's uh, the photographs are quite amazing and um, you're obviously such professional pho- photographers and it's, it's something we would have... I mean, when we get into the red zone, there'll be nothing there virtually... Um, so to be able to see how it was is um, quite remarkable. Absolutely, and I hope I hope it it, it is seen as that. Um, I do know that it has been, you know, and it still continues to be so difficult and frustrating for people who can't get in. But I do hope that it is seen as we were there for a reason, and just the the chances of other people being able to get in. It just, I mean. If you ask anyone, it generally, I'm sure it would be, well, I'd prefer to be working at a safe distance. It just had to be done. Um, and, and that's exactly what I think of, is that people in Christchurch and those close to Christchurch, I used to live there and my parents are there, I've got good friends there, that they will be able to see this as an opportunity and being able to, and maybe also understand how much effort and care went into looking after those people, even though they were deceased. Brian, tell me, why would you want to be a police forensic photographer? Where did it all begin for you? Um, I joined the police 10 years ago. Uh, so I was a frontline um, police officer. And I have to admit, by total chance discovery, I realised that there was a photography unit. And I, just, I was able to make the move into photography. So that was about seven years ago. Um, and I've... From my 13th birthday, I got my first camera. I've always owned a camera, so I always had that interest anyway. And just, it just flowed and, you know, it just happened for me. So I was just very lucky. And you, I, 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 I guess your work isn't enjoyable, uh, but you must get some feeling of reward from it. Yes, it's hard. <laughs> it is a hard one to describe, Um things I take for granted and it's a normal day for me and I am very careful in how I describe a normal day if someone's asking me. It, it just, things don't phase me. Uh, gen, in most, most cases, they don't phase me. Uh, but in saying that I do, I have to say I do enjoy my job. Um, I go to things that are, are incredibly horrific but at the same time can also be very fascinating in maybe how something has occurred. And then for me, it's just, it really becomes how on earth am I going to photograph this, especially if we're in some really tricky place or um, if it's been a suspicious death, things like that. I can't disturb evidence at the same time. So, yeah, it's 
it just becomes work takes over. And I imagine there's always a challenge and there's so much variety. Yes, there is. There is. We have our bread and butter, um, which sounds awful actually because I will go and photograph a couple of victims a day from um, assault. Um, they may be in home or hospital. Um, I can also end up in a tow yard for a vehicle examination, arson scene. It, it's fairly never ending as well as taking photos for PR. I have a job where I get to fly and take aerial flo- photographs in a helicopter. So it's, it's pretty good across. Are more, are more women going into it? Um, we're a very limited unit, I suppose, nationally. Um, we have the largest team in Auckland, purely population-wise. Uh, we do have a fairly, I don't know if it's normal or surprising, but I would think a good, easily a good third of us are made up of females, and I don't know if that's an unusual thing or if it's fairly standard across um, the actual police population. So you go into the police force first? to be able to do this work. Mm. And you obviously have to be a good photographer. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and and that goes through on-the-job training as well as we're then sent back down to police college and we work through a certificate, a three-year certificate as well. So looking back on the um, the week uh, that you were down there, the the nearly fortnight, what what will you remember? Oh, um, having been... Having lived in Christchurch, I knew the city so well. So, certainly a sticking point is just I went out a couple of times by myself, and it was so so silent um, and deserted. It, it was silly because in the distance I can still see search and rescue, where I can still see a policeman. The fact is that there was it was the middle of a day, beautiful day, and there is no cars, no movement anywhere. So that, and it's just even still so hard to in a photograph or a video even. Um, the highs would be meeting and working with the other police photographers who we obviously don't generally get to work with at all. Um, and the team feeling, I thought, and not just photographers, it's every single person that went in there, including the contractors. We were working quite closely, especially in those early days of the cathedral, you know, taking crane workers, things like that. So it was just this one team. We were all just there for one thing and it was just open arms and it was just all, everyone, it was all inviting. So, yeah. Briar, uh, Briar Douglas, thank you for your time and Christchurch Beyond the Cordon through the eyes of the New Zealand police photographers. The royalties are going to the Family Help Trust in Christchurch, which is affiliated with Jig- Jigsaw, the National Umbrella Group of Childhood Protection Services, and it's published by Hachette. And I recommend it highly as a record of uh, what most of us never, ever saw. Briar, thanks for your time. You're very, very welcome.